Ladies, be honest. Would you date a straight man that previously had a sexual encounter with another straight man? What about a bisexual man? Now, what if I told you that a 2019 survey from Glamour Magazine found that 63% of respondents said that they would not date a man that had had sex with another man? Feel a little more comfortable to be a little more honest? Because anecdotally, I see, I see the responses to questions like this online. And most of the comments, the ladies are like, It's fine, it just couldn't be me. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Mm. Now, I should say that this survey did not say the sexual orientation of the women that responded. And it was only a thousand people. So it's not some huge wide scale but like I said, I've heard a lot of women of all different types of orientations, and Raina has said this too, anecdotally of course, say that they would not or just couldn't seriously date a man that said that he was bisexual or that he had had an encounter with another man. I mean, remember that episode of Insecure? You can't keep dating him, he's gay. Because that totally makes him gay, right? Bitch, sophomore year, you hooked up with that chick who looked like Lisa Turk. Okay, who didn't? It's different for women. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You're telling me that once a dude touches a dick, he's gay? Yes. yes. So it's like straight, 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 Z bag. Yes. It's a double standard, but oh well, that's how it is. Molly let go of a good man, a fine man, simply because he tried to be a little fruity once and was like, yeah, it's not for me. And he was honest about it. So what's the deal? Why are some of the ladies so reluctant to date men that have either had sexual encounters with other men, maybe just once or half a one and were like, I'm good. Or the men that are bisexual. Why is it so taboo? Why is it so strange? Well, a concept that I immediately thought of and wanted to explore more of to help tease out these questions was the down low paradox. And you'll see why it's a paradox throughout this video if I do my job right. But speaking of my job, bonjour na come hi and welcome slash welcome back to season three, episode six of You Can Always Change Your Mind, a show where if I do my job right, you may feel compelled to do what the title says or not because I'm not the boss of you. I am, however, a bitch who decided to get another set of lip piercings and I already got some juicy lips. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so they swollen right now. So you may have noticed I'm talking funny. Anyway, so that's just what's gonna happen throughout this video. We're just gonna get into it. It'll be fine. With all that being said, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, you know, algorithm donations and whatnot are greatly appreciated. Check out some merch if you want to support the channel via capitalism. If you don't want to do that and you're like, I'd rather support you directly, you can join my Patreon. And if you don't want to do any of that, like I said, algorithm donations are greatly appreciated or those super chat things because this is a live stream. Y'all can utilize that stuff too. Let's give a shout out to today's sponsor and then let's get into it. So guess who's giving away free sex toys and gift cards to free sex toys to everyone who enters a giveaway. <laughs> Me and the dolls over at Belessa. Stay tuned to find out more. Belessa is a bi women company for all things sexuality, meaning erotica, porn, sex ed, toys, all the things. And they are all about wanting everybody to embrace and explore their sexuality and sensuality in many different ways. And having used a few products from the toy section, I can tell you they really are doing some incredible work over there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of toys, so this yellow number is the Demi Wand. Works for all body types, which means orgasms for everybody, okay? It's got this whisper quiet design. It's very compact super discreet, comes in this super cute yellow charging case. All of them come, well, not all of them, but most of them come in these super cute charging cases, as you'll see. Next up is the Air Vibe. We've got some dual stimulation for your G-spot and your clitoris. Comes in a casing so discreet, it almost looks like a compact, y'all, truly. So 
you know, do with that what you will. This one's waterproof, rechargeable, and silent but deadly. Next up, we got the Pebble. This one is also suction and vibration, but both are controlled independently. It's ergonomically built to fit perfectly into your hand. Look at how adorable this thing is. And it doesn't have a bunch of annoying pattern modes. Also comes in a super cute rechargeable case. Love the color pink. Next up we have the thrust. Listen, Balesa used thousands of pieces of community feedback to make sure they crafted the thrust accurately with, with you and me in mind clearly because this thing right here, you hear how my voice cracked a little bit? It is powerful and it is a realistic thrusting vibrator, okay? It's got five insertable inches and has a ring of swirling beads at the base of the shaft. Listen, this thing is USB chargeable, waterproof, and honestly, honestly, this right here, I just, there are no words. If you enter this giveaway for nothing else, do it for the potential of getting this. Like, Valessa, do you want me to interact with human beings? <laughs> Kidding. And like I said at the beginning of this video, free toys or gift cards for free toys for everyone who signs up for the giveaway, which will be linked in the description below. The age of pleasure is upon us. Join us, y'all. Thank you so much to Valessa for sponsoring today's video, and let's get back into it. All right. Thank you very much for all the support, no matter how you chose to do it or not, cause I'm not gonna know. And let's get in to today's episode. So what is down low? Well, it's a subculture of black men, and I will explain why it's specifically black men or mostly black men who have sex with other men, but do not consider themselves gay or queer or bisexual or anything like that. As Benoit Denzel Lewis put, that is an incredible name. Benoit Denzel Lewis. That's a writer's name. Ernest Hemingway who? <laughs> Wait, let me so all it. I'm like, who? Oh, Benoit Denzel Lewis. Sorry, I said Benoit Denzel Lewis. <laughs> Dyslexic, I, I really do need to get tested. As Benoit Denizet Lewis put it in a piece for Slate, if the closet is a stifling lonely place for white guys who realize they're gay, but aren't ready to admit it publicly, the down low is a VIP party for masculine men who will never admit to being homosexual because they don't see themselves that way. And this theme of associating being down low with masculinity came up a lot in the research. As always, everything will be linked below. Don't do me. And some of the speculations or theorizing of why this is the case is because keeping that masculine energy, keeping that identity or identifying with straightness still, it doesn't give you the extra markedness of what being black and gay or bisexual would give you. I think about the very beginning of Paris is Burning. Yes, I know the documentary is controversial. But one of the interviewees says that. You say you have three strikes against you in this world. Like every black man has two. That they're just black and they're a male. But you're black and you're a male and you're gay. You're gonna have a hard fucking time. So he said, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna have to be stronger than you ever imagined. And no, it is not just in black American culture that you'll witness men participating in same sex relationships, whether it's a dabble or on multiple occasions, but denying any sort of queer labeling. But as Tony Sylvia emphasizes in their piece, straight men's same sex behavior, black DL culture puts a lot of emphasis on masculinity. And again, Sylvia thinks this comes from the risk of quote, double discrimination. You know, you have a mark against you already for being black. So now you're gonna be queer, part of the alphabet mafia. You're just asking for more trouble. And if you don't think that's the case, just look around at the laws. Just look around at the world. Look around at the fact that people can't openly say that they're gay, even in majority black countries. In black culture, black American culture, there is this reverence for strength. 
And I'm not gonna say that it's just for the men to be strong because black women are so resilient. Black women are strong. You don't need no man. You were strong in a minute, black woman. And they're stereotypes and tropes, yes. And we are moving away from those things. But at least anecdotally, I have witnessed and experienced the ideas of, yeah, you are strong. You need to be. You don't just cry for no reason. I will give you something to cry about, blah, 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 blah. In a culture that reveres strength, a trait associated with masculinity, even if it's not about, let's say, trying to appease a white gaze of sorts, even if it's just to fit in culturally amongst other black folks, there is still the expectation to live up to what masculinity means. The more masculinely you behave, the less likely you are to be coded as queer or gay. So even if you love being smashed by the other dudes, if you're masculine enough, you're not gay. That's for limp wrist. that's not for you. Now, according to Laylee Phillips, the term DL was initially associated with black men that were straight, that were just caught cheating. So they were on the DL cheating in general. It didn't have to do with sexuality, it was just y'all were cheating. But black men don't cheat, so you know. There isn't exact agreement on when the term DL as we know it became a thing. Our homie with a fabulous name, Dennis at Lewis, says that black men were using this term for themselves in the mid 90s, but Laylee Phillips says that it was used in certain black communities earlier, although she doesn't give an exact date, so we don't have exact timing. But, but two things have remained consistent. The term has been associated with black men and has been used to emphasize the difference between homosexual identity and homosexual behavior. Homosexual behavior is marked with certain types of a little too feminine, anything girly basically, or girl adjacent. The closer in proximity you are to that as a man, the more you are queer coded, gay coded, like, you, you a little fruity and a booty, what's going on there? Even though we know you can be hyper-masculine and be queer, but in a culture that reveres masculinity and then especially reveres it in its men, in a culture that has some pretty rigid rules on what the genders are supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And therefore, even if let's say like Jay, a video from a few months back, you are attracted to women, to cis women, but you are effeminate and love to dress a certain way, love to dress girly, all of these things. Even if you sleep with a woman, the thing that is supposed to make you the most heterosexual in the world, if you have the, the girly queer codedness, the being too feminine, you are participating in homosexual behavior. No amount of protesting and saying that you're straight will counter that because of a little thing we call stigma. So on June 5th, 1981, the US Centers for Disease Control, CDC, publishes an article in its Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. On that same day, a New York dermatologist reports cases of a rare cancer in gay men in New York and LA. By July, the term gay cancer is in the public lexicon. In December of that year, a pediatric immunologist treats five black children with the same disease and three of the five children's mothers engaged in drug use and slash or sex work. So the doctor's diagnoses are dismissed by their colleagues. So the next year, in May of 1982, the New York Times publishes the first mention of GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. Now the initial report from the CDC and all of these cases that I just outlined in this timeline would later become known, of course, as AIDS. But the CDC didn't actually use that term until September of 1982. Unfortunately, by that point, the damage was kind of already done. And by damage, I mean people typically associating this disease with gay people. And if you weren't gay and you got it, 
as I said in the cases before, sex workers, drug users, basically the deviants of society. Now, why are we talking about HIV AIDS? If we're gonna talk about stigma, specifically the stigma associated with DL men and why men then paradoxically become DL, looking at the AIDS epidemic is a good place to tease out where a lot of this stigma came from. Not necessarily the beginning of the stigma. We know that folks were called inverts. Queer is seen as weird, which is why not all members of the Alphabet Mafia like that word. There was this stigma that didn't start during the HIV AIDS epidemic, but really festered during it. And there are different types of stigma. This one in particular was a health practitioner kind of stigma. And quickly stigmas by Merriam-Webster are a set of negative and unfair beliefs that a society or group of people has about something. Other definition, it can be a mark of shame or discredit. With this health practitioner stigma, you have doctors, health practitioners that are supposed to be the least judgmental of all of us because they're the ones that are taking care of us. My health is in your hands. And if I'm going to tell you the absolute truth about every little detail of my life so you can get the full picture so you can treat me accurately, I need to know that you're not gonna judge me. And Antonia pointed out that this also could relate to people being afraid of being stigmatized and therefore not seeking treatment. And this is something Aubrey Gordon talks about with being fat, being stigmatized in such a way that even if you do go and see a doctor, your concerns, your own understanding of your body, none of that will be taken seriously. Another type of stigma is public stigma. And this is when the public is endorsing negative stereotypes and discrimination. <laughs> Examples of this, when we look at being queer and why men might want to be DL, we look at the way people called anyone that was part of the Alphabet Mafia, queer and invert, deviants. If y'all remember the quote from Nussenbaum's book about gay men from that pamphlet. Every year, a quarter or more of homosexuals visit another country. Fresh American germs get taken to Europe, Africa, and Asia, and fresh pathogens from these continents come here. Foreign homosexuals regularly visit the US and participate in this biological swap beat. Gay people have kinky deviant sex. So obviously they're gonna have kinky deviant diseases. And even if you're not gay, if you are associated with them, you'll have them too. Next type of stigma, stigma by association, which is basically what it sounds. My mom used to always ask me if I was gay and was like, you could tell me, you could tell me. Are you a lesbian? You could tell me, you know. I don't know how parents know, but they just do. But anyway, part of it was cause I guess she just knew, but the other part of it was because I had queer friends. She <laughs> would do the thing. It's okay if you're friends with them, them, plural, plural. It's okay if you're friends with them, but you know, don't let it rub off on you. Stigma by association. And I have to ask you if there wasn't a stigma attached to being queer. And if that wasn't attached by association, why is it that it is so cool to see or so different or unique to see straight men having queer friends. Is it rare to see straight cis men with queer friends? Is this a generational thing? Why don't we see more straight men at gay bars just there to have a good time, to be like, hey, I'm not interested, but also that. And I know there are other factors. I'm not saying this is the only reason we don't see straight men in queer spaces and it's not saying that queer people even want straight people in their spaces. Like, girl, I, listen, this is not an invitation. I didn't say that. But even just in your everyday life, if you're straight, how many queer friends do you have? Like how diverse is your friend group really? Or as another example, if you're a man attracted to trans women, there's a stigma attached to trans people and a stigma by association if you sleep with. There's this structural stigma and this is where we see at least for me, this is where you see those naturalist arguments that piss me off. Thinking about things of the inherent aggression of black bodies. And this is where, as an example, those black codes that you saw during reconstruction era, where if you just existed as a black person walking around vagrancy laws, you didn't have a job. It could be used as an excuse to literally police your black body. We can't let these people just be out here existing. The stigma by association that I was talking about before also relates to sexual stigma, at least in the way that Julia Sereno describes it. Sereno talks about this contamination, this catching. 
everything sticks to you because of stigma. When there's a stigma, it's all these assumptions, all these ideas, all these stereotypes, these tropes that people have, they stick to you a bit easier. Stigmas can feel kind of permanent. Like think about the body count question, you know, when people are like, oh, would you sleep with a girl? She slept with this many people. And it's like, you lose your virginity, lose your virginity, that whole concept, you lose it. And all of a sudden you have the stigma associated with you now that you are sexual, your body is sexual. And if there are more men that you've slept with, particularly in, we're talking straight sense, then there's that extra stigma attached to it, right? Or, like I was using the insecure example from before, a dude sucks dick once and all of a sudden, you can't trust that he's attracted to you even if you've had great sex and they're a generous lover and all the best things. You just can't trust it because they are contaminated because they did this sexual act with this dude once 10 years ago in a bathroom stall. As Sereno explains that the way the sexual stigma also works is that if you have sex with somebody that has this contamination, that has had this sexual encounter with others it, that are stigmatized, if you become sexually involved with them, you are also tainted by association. And then of course, after all these different types of stigmas, there's a self-stigma. The one that you put onto yourself where you feel as negatively about yourself as the world around you is telling you you should feel. And this is where we get to the paradox because if you are a black man and let's say you are 80% straight, 20% of you just likes a little bit of uh, dude action. Just a little bit, you know, I don't need a lot, just a little bit, a little bit of this, a little, you know, just a little bit. All these different types of stigma come into play. You know how people treat gay black men. Maybe you've had those thoughts yourself, you know? Maybe you've treated gay black men a certain way yourself, so you do know, you're familiar. Are you gonna feel any sort of incentive to admit that to people? That you might be just a little bit queer, a little bit gay, a little bit fruity in a booty? Do you see why then people would become more down low? Because we shame people into, let's get to the shame part. Let's get to the shame part. I think it's important to add that for men, there's also a cultural message that promotes homophobic cruelty. If you want to be masculine in our culture, it's not enough to be straight. You must also show an outward disgust toward the gay community. The idea of do this or dislike these people if you want to be accepted into our group emerged as a major shame setup in the research. Now we can't be surprised if all this stigmatizing and policing of all of our sexualities and behaviors, but in this specific episode, men, we can't be surprised that that'll result in some men deciding to opt into this DL lifestyle. Can we? And expanding it a bit more, I think this relates to men that are also attracted to trans women. There's, there's the stigmatization, all the different types of stigma you're talking about, but especially sexual stigma of what that means. We put a lot of stigma around sex and shame ourselves and other people, not just for having sex or for participating or being curious about it or anything, but we put a lot of shame around the kinds of sex people are having. For a while we were kink shaming people and then it was sometimes maybe we should kink shame people because some of y'all are weird and it's all of these different things where none of it really allows room for vulnerability because that requires you being open and honest and trusting the space and the people that you're doing that with to say the things that you like, to say the things that you want, to say the things that you're curious about, to ask questions. And sex is an intimate thing. And it's something that we should be able to talk about and ask questions. In The Right to Sex, Srinivasan talks about how, you know, two people can end up in a room banging it out, I'm paraphrasing, banging it out without either one of them ever having said the word sex. Do you discuss sex with your partner beforehand? Have you gone into a room and just never even said the word but still had it? I don't really know how true that is for queer dynamics because I feel like anytime I've dated another queer person, we talk about sex very openly, but in straight world, I don't know how prevalent that is. And part of me thinks that is because having been indoctrinated, and I'm using that word on purpose, into heterosexuality, being straight, all the things, 
shame was a huge part of that, was a huge part of how I learned about sex and what sex was, what it wasn't supposed to be and who I was supposed to have it with. And if I desired other urges, those were urges to be ashamed about. So again, I say this, you cannot be surprised. And it is a paradox then that you will have men being shamed and told that they are not supposed to like any sort of thing related to other men. If they do, they're gay or bisexual. And if they are, even if they're bisexual, they're just gay. They're lying to themselves and to everyone else. Even if they know what they're like, society knows it, what they like. Because if you even like a little bit of queerness, whether you identify fully queer or not, you're guilty by association. So we already know you're gay girl. You might as well admit it. Like, I don't know why you're acting like you're straight. We can't be surprised then that having all of that in your face would make you go, well, why the fuck would I tell anyone that I'm bi or queer? And I'm not saying that it's okay to be dishonest to people about, particularly if you're having sex with somebody and they need to know, if you're having unprotected sex with people and y'all are doing some things, you need to have conversations in general, okay? When's the last time you got tested? All that stuff, whatever. But it can't be surprised if men are then scared or some men are then scared of coming out and admitting that they like just maybe even a little bit of stuff. We shame and police the way men have sex so much that even liking booty stuff given to you by a woman, some men would say that's still gay. Oh my God, we, when is the sun gonna explode? <laughs> okay. Hey, homegirl, homeboy, and homies, nieces, nephews, and nibblings. I'm back. <laughs> and I'm going to jump right into this straight no chaser because I'm here to provide an anecdotal and empirical evidence-based perspective, right? I am a queer person, and I've had my own run-ins with DL men, DL culture. And yes, as you might have guessed, I have been a DL man in the past. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what? What, what y'all saying in the comments? Oh, Khadija said that in order for you to be DL, you have to be masculine presenting. I agree. I agree. You have to be able to fool the people that you're straight in order for you to be DL. But masculinity, in particular in the United States, has elements of performance, right? So don't believe your eyes. Believe your ears, okay? Let's move on. Anyway, I have conflicting thoughts about DL culture. Two schools of thought, right? And they're, I, don't, I don't know if they're necessarily opposing but they're in conversation. And how could I not have these conflicting schools of thoughts as someone who really has had interactions with, you know, DL men and who has been, you know, the DL out by self. The first of which is like, on one hand, it's gross. There are too many instances to count of DL men who put queer folk in harm's way. There are too many instances of DL men who target queer folk, queer men, trans women, right, trans folk. They use our bodies as sexual objects and have no real interest in creating spaces of intimacy and care and, and you know, setting sex up in the way that it should be. Right. And it's particularly saddening for me because I understand that for so many queer folk, that's going to be our first run in with intimacy. That's going to be our introduction to sex and what intimate space should look and feel like. If I'm going to be honest, in many ways, I feel like DL men are a cancer and really DL culture is a cancer to the queer community. And, and actually every community, right? Everybody is impacted. And I, I say DL culture because I don't want us to just focus on the subjects, right, of this conversation. I want us to focus on the the social structures that inform the conditioning of those subjects and what informs the acts, the violent acts in this case, that they act out on other folk that are a part of this conversation. They're victims in many ways, right? And I'm, I'm, we're going to get more nuanced in this conversation, but it does often feel like queer folk and trans folk are the victims or the infectees of the cancer that is their lies of romanticism. I feel like in so many ways they serve as a reminder to identifiably queer and trans folk and non-identifiably queer and trans folk, right, who are just open about who we are, of their ability and willingness to exercise and weaponize their masculine privilege and their hetero presentation. But then there's my other hand, right? Then there's my other school of thought, which is we choose to engage with these men, right? Some of the best sex of my life has been with the, uh, you know what? <laughs> This is not that kind of video. But I will say this, even though I personally have divested from and no longer engage with the trade in that manner, I don't blame and I actually understand myself 
and the girls who do engage with them sexually and even romantically. Because even though we know that they're straight identifying and there's no hope of a future outside of the, the quiet secret places, the explanation is still very simple. We all are socialized to understand manhood and men in a particular way right a specific way manhood is inextricably linked and i said this before in my last video when i was here with you guys to masculinity and a particular kind of masculinity that is hyper and that is violent really makes them more desirable and more man right if you are hyper masculine and you express loudly your queer phobia your femme phobia transphobia you become more of a man right in this society because they're connected Unfortunately, it's a toxic tie. Another conversation for another day. So here comes this strapping young gentleman who is traditionally masculine in every sense of the word, and including the most violent, being that they are misogynistic, phobia, hate the gays, right? But they like you, right? They like you for whatever the reason and whatever manner it is that they said that they have an interest in you. And something about that makes that man more desirable because that's the real man. These other gay men that are expressing interest, these queer men who are open about their queerness, I, identify as queer and or are, or are identifiably queer, right? Whether that is feminine attributes, a feminine voice, a broken wrist, switching the walk, sweetness in a booty, whatever it may be. I can tell that you're queer in ways that I cannot for this man outside of the fact that he wants to do me. There's nothing identifiable about their queerness. And actually, they go so far as to hate and abhor the gays. Something about that is more desirable because, again, they become a real man in our mind. Now, who doesn't want a real man? Who doesn't want a real man? But also, even independent of our desires and outside of the sexual context, I think it's important to humanize them as well, right? Because they are not objects themselves. They are the subject of this conversation. And so I don't want to continually frame them as sexual deviants or even sexual predators. That is not my intention. I understand the queerphobic and transmissic society that creates the foundation on which DL identity is formed. I'm sorry for them in many regards. Yes, living in an identifiably queer or trans body puts us at risk for harm in ways that DL people just can't understand, right? I'd refuse to realize for themselves. But I couldn't imagine a life where I'm living as a shell of myself, right? One where I don't allow myself access to true my true identity, the love, the community, the care, the intimacy that I really want, that I deserve. I couldn't imagine a life where my identity is forcibly hidden, even to me, by me, right? And that's the worst part. You are the violator of yourself. You are the aggressor and the violator of your personhood and all that you could be. And when I was last here, I brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And just what it is that every human needs to live up to their fullest potential and their highest purpose. And atop that hierarchy is self-actualization. You will never grow as a person. You'll never be able to actualize your fullest potential, your fullest purpose, and live your best, softness, whatever life you want, right? If you're denying yourself access to yourself, you get what I'm saying? And I understand you don't, there's, there's immense privilege being deemed straight, and you don't want to lose access to that. Khadija has talked about that at, at nauseum, has talked about stigma, has talked about really, really salient points, so important to this discussion, right? Um, and I understand that. And that is, that is, that's why this second hand that I'm thinking like, wow, they're going through a lot, but they cause so much pain, strife, and turmoil, not just in the hetero community, right? Lives are torn apart in the queer community because of their decisions to engage with us and sell us fantasies. Honey, they be selling the, the dolls fantasies, right? It's not always just dip, do, and leave. They dip, do, and they want to be held in ways that they feel like they can't be held by their heterosexual m woman partner, right? I also have a thought that popped up in my mind as I was thinking about what I could add to this conversation. And I think something, and you tell me what you think, because maybe I'm bugging out. But particularly for black DL men, right, which is really the crux of the DL paradox, right? Black men who have sexual desires for anyone who they're told they're not supposed to have sexual desires for outside of the children. 
stay with it. I feel like a part and another layer to their fear of fully embracing and realizing their queer identity is that the black community strips blackness away from the queer community. Right. When you are identified with the queer. And I think this has to do with all of the propaganda around the gay agenda and how it lives and manifests itself, particularly in the black community. People will see. You know, flyers, we, we, particularly we're in Pride Month, right? So they see flyers of a black queer person, a Latino trans person, a white, you know, gay man. And they start to hold us in proximity to non-blackness and the privilege associated with that. And even more so to whiteness, right? Right. You are in community with those white gays. So you have access right to the privilege that comes with being a gay person but really what they mean to say is a white gay person right you guys are in community with one another i find a similar kind of rhetoric happens with black feminists who engage with white feminists who are also intersectional feminists right black feminist theory um because you know we can't do those other ways of feminism it's just not as inclusive and expansive as it should be right but i see a similar i don't necessarily see them stripping them of their blackness but i do see them checking them Right. Checking these black women like, wait a minute, we got to talk about bl being black first. Right. People aren't interested in having two conversations, three conversations at once, having the multiplexed layer discussion. No, no. Black people said, let's discuss niggas. Let's discuss nigga issues. Let me stop using the word. <laughs> let's discuss that first. Right. And if you can't do that, then I'm going to take away your black card. Right. And, and because being a woman is as much of your identity as your blackness is because being if you identify that way, um, being queer, I'm just as queer as I am black. I am saying there is something there that is just a thought that I want to, you know, I want to put the plant that seed in your mind and tell me if you resonate with that, if that resonates with you. Um, I think that is why a song like Cozy is so important by Beyonce, um, because she's marrying the experience of blackness and queerness in ways that we need to start having, you know, we need to start having those conversations in music and art and culture in spaces like these in literature. Right. Um, and I think a lot of DL black men are like, I know, I know fairy. Right. I'm not a baguette. Right. I'm a real man. I'm a real, I'm a black man. Right. I don't know. That's something I'm still working out. This is incredibly complex right this this topic is paradoxical even right there needs to be a deep dive a layered text a layered you know conversation around the dl paradox oh. <laughs> oh yeah uh, 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 uh. i know what i i know what i could you know it's your girl. So I'm going to pass the mic back to our friend Khadij um, so that they can go ahead and rip it up, eat it up, break it down. I've got to get out of here, but I'll see you guys around, okay? Either here on Khadija's page or over on my page, which is somewhere on the screen. Okay. <laughs> got a blast. But before I let you go, you know, I'll never leave without saying this. I am in a constant state of practice. And so are you. You can never fail when you're in a constant state of practice. Mad love, especially to the DL men. It, now, if oh, oh, one and one last thing, if you're gonna be DL because you're afraid to come out and you're and and it's really about fear. It's really about I don't know. You know, you're, you're not violent in nature. You're, there's no there's nothing nefarious about how you engage with queer folk. There's no malintent. It's just about I don't know if I can do this. This feels larger than life, right? I'm with you. I feel you. Well, I'm not with you, but I feel you. I'm empathetic to that. All I would ask is that you can act as a covert ally, right? If you're with your straight friends, eat something as simple as not allowing transmissic, homophobic, femphobic conversation to happen amongst you, right? You don't have to be so anti-gay and homophobic and, and violent, right? Or engage in, in violent discussion with those people. You can be a covert ally, Right. Um, and change discussions in small ways. And hopefully you finally feel there's a space for you to actualize yourself and to come into yourself. I'm really out this time. Bye. <laughs>men feel that to be masculine they need to identify as straight. This is one reason why fewer men than women identify as bisexual and report same-sex experiences. Women are perceived as less socially valuable than men 
and therefore have more flexibility to engage in same-sex sexual behavior. Gender inequality, in other words, makes it less likely that men will have sex with other men or identify as bisexual. If we are talking about liberation, liberating ourselves, liberating others, all the things, that means actual liberation. That means actually being allowed to have choices. Doesn't mean you're always gonna utilize those choices or even want them, but they should be available to you. And if you are a dude that takes a Kinsley, Kinsey scale to, Kinsley, Kinsey, whatever it is, test, or you just know you like a bit of, of, of queerness, a bit of queer behavior, and you also like cis women, then you should be allowed to explore that. And I know generationally it's a thing that's shifting. I think I'm in the weird middle place because I was born in the early 90s where like, I still heard a lot of the stuff about men being DL or I still heard in TV shows and media and in real life, you know, oh, men always say that they're bisexual before they come out as being fully gay. You know, I heard a lot of the stuff growing up, but I also was, growing up in a time where people are pushing back against those things a little bit. And I think younger generations are pushing back even more. There is more of an embracing of, at least in the digital space, so who knows how much of this is translating into the real world, but more of an embracing of different types of expressions of masculinity and manliness, whatever that means. And also dismantling and tearing apart of, you know, the binary. Y'all know I love to talk shit about the binary. Talking about feelings, of course, I think the more we think about ourselves as emotion scientists, as Dr. Mark Rackett says, not emotion judges, emotion scientists in terms of emotions like guilt and shame and remorse and all these things that can become tied into the way we have sex, the relationships that we have, the intimacy that we have, the, the attractions that we have, if we can unpack those things and understand our emotions better without judging them, I think that shame starts to wither away. And anecdotally again, for me, it definitely has. The more I look at myself and my body and my desires and the things that I enjoy and the things that I thought that I would never enjoy doing, sexually, all that other stuff that I have given myself a chance to try, like my joke is, I'll try anything twice. You know, once just to try it and the second time to make sure if I really do like it or if I'm really like, nah, I'm not, I'm not into this, you know? The more I've given myself permission to have a curiosity and not judge whoever I'm with for the stuff that they're into, trying to, yeah, be a scientist about it and understand and just approach it with curiosity instead of judgment, it's allowed me to be less ashamed about myself, what I like, what I don't like, and just who I am in general. And that's very liberating. Girl, in a bedroom is real liberating, like, mm. And the menses deserve this too. Men, you can't have this reputation of being shitty and I'm kidding, this has nothing to do with men being good at sex. <laughs> but it does have to do with men feeling comfortable to share their interests, to share their desires, to share the things that they're into. If you want to, but feel like you can't, then how free are you really? Hmm? Just, just a thought. Whew, as always, let me know your thoughts, y'all. If you wanna hear me talk a bit more about permission and pleasure and just other random shit, you can check out my second channel, Chaotic Viewing. Just doing commentary and reaction videos, talking about my favorite media, talking about things that happen as they come up when I feel like it. It's chaotic and you're viewing it, so. Branding is simple, folks. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel, for supporting the series. We are over halfway through. I've loved these episodes. I've loved putting this out for y'all. Everyone is doing such hard work behind the scenes. Like seriously, it's just been so truly a labor of love. Love, love. See, my lips too swollen. I gotta stop talking, y'all. I gotta stop, okay. As always, don't forget to feed your plets, water your plets, and plets. I can't, <laughs> like my lips, okay. As always, don't forget to feed your plets, water your plets, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye. Both of them are in here, just sitting. My little babies are both in here, just sitting. That's so cute. Okay. okay.
Let's just make sure everything's set up. Okay, I think this is good. My hair looks a bit messy. My lips are still super swollen. <coughs> this is how I feel. I'm cold and I'm awake, lying naked on the ground. Oh my God, y'all. God, I don't know why I thought it would be smart to get two lip piercings. They're really cute, but oh, they are healing and it is hurting. The motion's never fade into something real. Well, it's not hurting as much today, but just the inside, because you know how they gotta make the bar long. So that, because my lips are big, so they're still swollen. So they swole a lot, swole, swole, whatever. And so because of that, uh, it's like hitting my gums right now. But as soon as it's like heals and it's shortened, it won't be so annoying. But yeah, right now it's like, Oh, he's looking for a toy. There's a toy back there. If I get you the toy, will you leave? The conversation has run dry. -da 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 -da. Oh, here comes Tiny. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's fine. You're fine. You're fine. What's the song again? Talking like I got teeth removed or something. And I got tooth gens. So new tooth gens. So I had these ones for like a, a year. And then I got a dagger. And then I got this butterfly cut in half. Yeah. Something's on a tongue. It's gone. Ooh. I'm just like in the mood to record. Sometimes I'm not, and I can feel it when I'm making a video, but today we're in the mood for love and the mood to record. Okay, I'm gonna stop doing this. Okay, let's just limit our talking.